Okay, YouTubers, anti-nuke activists, and uh, people that are all around suspicious of government. This is for you. Okay, I want to jump right into my screen captures from the NRC Freedom of Information Act documents. They're pub available to the public and free. And I want to look at a Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Japan, a, a circulation of theirs that goes out to all missions. This is from the 12th of April, 2011. So this is a month after the tsunami and the earthquake. And I want to look at two sections of this screen capture, and then we'll concentrate in this particular video, in this discussion. I want to debunk their estimates, their models on the plume and the fallout, okay? And, and again, I put it to you that they know better, and they were purposefully downplayed, and, and I'll get to that in just a second. First of all, I want to read to you uh, this section at the top. It says, with regard to the accident at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, the Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, NISA, has decided to raise nuclear accident severity level, according to the INES standard, to the highest level 7, parentheses, same as the accident at Chernobyl, close parentheses, from current level 5, based on the latest information gained. Okay, let me have a quick look at that and let's talk about that real quick because when you look at the severity of the accident, what they knew early on, prolonged station blackout, Zerk fire, melt on the floor, all this other business, you would look at probably one unit and say that's a level seven. I mean, to be quite honest with you, with what we know now and, and what they knew then, because many of us are were ignorant and we're still learning, but the experts know all this and have known it all along. So to even raise it to a seven, that's still quite ridiculous and utterly downplayed because you have multiple units in question. And each of these has the potential to release vast amounts of radiation. And in fact, that's exactly what was ongoing. And there's a prolonged station blackout. You can't cool the, the, the fuel and you can't get power or water to it. And so you, the worst of the worst does happen in a prolonged station blackout. And so, again, if you want to give it a fair rating, you would look at each individual unit and say, well, four, while it wasn't active at the time, it had a heavy offload into the spent fuel pool. Uh, units one, two, and three uh, did, were functioning at the time, and unit three also had a spent fuel pool fire. And so looking at that, you're going to look at each one and say, well, each one of these with this corium melt through, this China syndrome, it's, it's got to be at least a Chernobyl level. And I would go through on each one, and at least to be fair, you would be much beyond, I don't know what that scale goes to, 10 or 12 or something like that. You would have to take it to its very highest, very highest, and say it's likely beyond that. This is a catastrophic uh, accident, I use that term loosely, like we've never seen before, like we've never seen before. And I use the term accident loosely, folks, because strangely absent from any government discussion is the possibility of a tsunami bomb or a remote earthquake set off through electromagnetic waves. This is what General Cohen, our Secretary of Defense, spoke about in 1997. Okay, now let's examine uh, the area I have highlighted here, and this is the, uh, the focus of this video is on their downplay of the modeling. And it says, the estimated total amount of radioactive material discharged into the air, however, is approximately 10% of that of the accident at Chernobyl. So they're raising the level to seven, but they're saying it's not a whole lot of emissions coming out of there. And this is total bunk. Let's, let's begin to debunk this. This next screen capture is one I just recently found, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of redoing this. And I've already done this already on, on the downplayed modeling. But again, this just concretes and makes my case that much more robust. And let's look at the highlighted. This is from an IAEA uh, release also from the 12th of April, 2011. And the important section to note, it says Russia was also vocal in this discussion, stating that it is, quote, not appropriate to compare accidents like Chernobyl and others because this is not what the INES system is for, end quote. Russia also, parentheses correctly, close parentheses, pointed out that the accident at Fukushima is still ongoing and it is premature to speculate how much radioactivity will be released in comparison to other accidents. Seemingly, Russia was concerned with Japan's announcement that the radioactive releases from Fukushima so far are only 10% of what Chernobyl released. Okay, and then I highlight another section where Russia is questioning, hey, how are you going to store all this radioactive water? How are you going to store all this radioactive liquid waste? And that's also relevant too, but that's the focus of this video I want to keep hammer home on this 
them trying to say it's only 10% of Chernobyl. These models were based on 96 hours or four to five days. And that is seriously downplayed. And here's Russia saying exactly what I myself and Kevin Blanche and a handful of others have been saying for some time now. And Russia is saying it's premature to speculate because this is ongoing. These emissions are ongoing. And I have measured plumes into April out of these Freedom of Information Act documents. So these plumes were ongoing for several months that we can prove beyond a doubt. And it certainly looks like now when TEPCO has a mystery steam episode coming out of Unit 3 a couple, three weeks ago. Yes, these emissions are ongoing. You can't model it on four to five days or 96 hours. That's criminal. They know this. They know better than that. But that's how you hand the president a piece of paper that says you don't expect harmful levels of radioactivity, right? And this is criminal. This was a conspiracy. Multiple agencies were involved. Many hundreds, if not thousands, should be indicted and called to the stand. Should have already been a court case on this one. Let's look at this next screen capture here. And I have underlined the important section, but they're discussing a modeling of a of the plume and the fallout. And they're discussing the source term provided to NARAC, and this is an agency or a group that does modeling of plume and fallout. And I highlight the relevant section. It says, all 96-hour dose projections are well below the one rem total effective dose. Well, of course they can say that. It's only 96 hours of emanations. Plus, they never talk about plutonium. They never look at plutonium. Okay, so they go in there and say 96 hours. They, if you look at the source term, 25% of the total fuel in Unit 2 released to the atmosphere. 50% of the total spent fuel from Unit 3 was released in the atmosphere. 100% of the total spent fuel was released to the atmosphere from Unit 4. Again, that bolsters what I've been saying. They wouldn't be running that stuff if they didn't think it had been a melt on the floor and everything was released to the atmosphere. And this is all 96-hour dose projections. Alaska, Hawaii, West Coast are well below the one rim. Okay, but that's four to five days, or that's 96 hours. Let's look at the next screen capture, because this is the one where they discuss the president's case, the president's worst-case scenario. And... The male participant, we don't get to know his name, but Jim Wiggins is talking to him. Jim Wiggins would know, and Chairman Jacksco would know who this was. Says it's bounding. It includes the fuel in the three reactors, the fuel in four spent fuel pools. It does not include the common spent fuel pool around Unit 4, nor reactors 5 and 6 on any spent fuel pools there. And it's assumed a release based over a four to five day period. Again, that's incredibly downplayed. When they knew for weeks and weeks, and again, I say measured plumes, discussion of plumes up into into April, and recently we have mystery steam. So it's ongoing. I say ongoing for many, many months. Had they actually modeled it on the real length of time that would have been realistic, oh, it would have broke all of these protective action guidelines, and they did not want to give warnings. And folks, this is the crime. This is Plumegate. This is the cover-up. This is the uh, this the horror of it all. I mean, what can I say? Women and children out in the rain, pregnant women out in the rain, athletes exercising on the West Coast when the nanoparticulates and the aerosolized plutonium swept across us, folks. This is the the, the travesty of it all. Okay, the next screen cap again from the NRC FOIA documents pertaining to Fukushima and the relevant section I have highlighted. Let's look at this particular modeling they did. It says, Protective Measures Team identified need to update the source term for modeling. A MELCOR Trans-Pacific model needs to be worked, shows about 4.5 rem iodine to children. Interagency agreed on a model last night. We have requested NARAC, again, they do the modeling, to make changes showing 70% core damage versus the 33% damage assumed previously. We are trying to ensure that the over-conservatism errors in the 4.5 rim does not get issued. So right there they knew, the protective measures team, that that was uh, over-conservative, over-conservative, and they must have known that four to five days to model, 96 hours to model, criminal, absolutely criminal. You can't say you didn't know. It was an orchestrated, organized effort to be able to hand that president a piece of paper that says we don't expect harmful levels, according to NRC and other experts. Okay, next screen cap, again, from the NRC FOIA documents pertaining to Fukushima, Mr. Zimmerman. Yes, and just to throw a value at you to let you know why the concern is so high is that that Transamerica model guy from Scott Out is talking four and a half rims is a thyroid for infants in California. Chairman Jacksco, right. Mr. Zimmerman, 
So I think that's a high priority for us to get our arms around. Jacks go, yes. 4.5 rims. Again, that's based on what? 96 hour or four to five days at most. These emissions were many months ongoing at a very high level. And even today, they're still coming out to some degree, right? I, I don't deny that the bulk, the most intense emissions and emanations would be early on. And as the months pass, we would hope that would taper off. But again, this is a China syndrome. These fuel rods have melted into corium blobs. It's so superheated, they've melted down into the earth, left these lava tubes behind them, and the stuff is still coming out. The best they can do is pump water down the holes, is what seems to me is what they're probably doing. And thus, the Pacific Ocean is just getting hammered with plutonium and cesium and tritium and everything else. Okay, next screen capture. Mr. Weber. Again, from the NRC for you documents. Mr. Weber. We did get some new information. We got the results of the NARAC run for the plausible bounding scenario that we were working on yesterday and that Steve and Charlie talked about yesterday. Redacted, redacted. While they show that throughout the United States, the total effective dose tags would not be exceeded. It does show concern with respect to thyroid doses. In Alaska, up to 35 FAR rem for a one-year-old child projected thyroid dose. And that's for a northeast wind. And also up to 6.4 in Alaska for the thyroid dose for the one-year-old for an eastern wind. And in Midway, if the winds are from or to the east, would show a dose up to 4.9 rims to the thyroid for a one-year-old child. We are working through the interagency to understand and peer review those results. That means, in other words, if the results are too high, again, I tell you, they go back and they keep modeling and keep modeling. They eventually you get one that doesn't look so bad. And here's one, you know, even on four to five days or 96 hours, take your pick, that's still to the thyroid. I understand it's a different way they calculate to the thyroid, but nevertheless, to me, that's concerning knowing those numbers would be very, 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 very conservative based on what? Just a couple days, not even a month, not even two months. Again, I have measured plumes uh, from TEPCO in these FOIA documents. I'll try to remember to throw one in here. Uh, over a month after the catastrophic uh, meltdowns and the tsunami and the earthquake. So uh, over a month later, 40 days plus later, there are still things going on that plumes are being emitted. That means, you know, at some point there's a more intense release and it may taper off, but then something happens again, psh, boom, there's an emanation, plume, smoke, and you have another major release. And this was ongoing for many weeks. All these documents, if you read my book on Plumegate, I go down in there and show you that this is definitely the case. They talk about plumes for many weeks in. This is an ongoing event. They say it's not going away. Okay, now we're looking at a screen capture from the NRC website. And dose equivalent to an embryo fetus is 0.5 rem. 0.5 rem. And I try to keep it real and say let's look at the weakest of us the most vulnerable of our society, and that's the children, the babies, the, the unborn, the still in the womb, and that's what we're, we should be judging and basing everything on that. Like I say, with the Navy ships and plumes, they should have immediately assumed the worst case was real and sailed those guys into the wind and out of trouble, period, in the story, but they didn't. And same with the fallout and the plume. They should have looked and said, well, how much can a pregnant woman get? Hey, we should base stuff on that. And we shouldn't model them four to five days or 96 hours when we know two, three weeks in, there's still stuff. The rads are so high that workers won't even go in to work on it in certain situations. And finally, this last screen cap, I would just like to throw in there and continue to hammer home the fact there's no mention of plutonium. They don't want to talk about it. You know, a fuel rod after it's been used, there's plutonium in it. So plutonium, there's just a a vacancy, a total lack of, a void of discussion of plutonium, and that's that's criminal in and of itself. So the modeling is downplayed in the duration of the emanations of the radiation that's being ejected and carried away in the form of plumes and radioactive cloud, and plus they're not modeling for plutonium or not, and no discussion of plutonium at all. And I tell you, that's absolutely criminal, absolutely criminal. Okay, so that pretty much um, under 20 minutes, that should give you an idea of how Obama was able to come out and keeping himself, his nose clean, he's able to say, hey, NRC told me that and other experts told me that. Well, where does the, where's the crime for sure? Well, at NRC and with NARAC and DITRA and Sandy and all these DOE and all these agencies and the people that work for them that downplayed the models. They knew it'd be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And had they actually realistically modeled that, holy smokes, 
we would have some inkling of an idea of what we were really hit with. And that's why those rooftop grabs, and again, I talk about this in my book, those rooftop grabs at power plants here in the United States, the measurements were forwarded into a password protected database we'll never get to see. We'll never get to see. Okay, that's it, guys. Thanks for sticking around for another video trying to debunk some of this. Uh, wow, it's just a travesty and it's a crime. And as people begin to get sick, as the years roll on, you know, it's going to come to a head. And I hope everyone has a, a decent education by then in nuclear power. It's kind of incumbent upon you to learn as much as you can about the truth about nuclear power. Okay, Patrick Penry, have a great day. Over now.